Each of us has a unique career story to tell. For some, these fly high like rocket launches. For others, they're more like the game of shoots and ladders, with advances and setbacks along the way. Either way, we learn countless lessons from these experiences. And that's what we put into the spotlight here at Career Sessions Career Lessons. Join discussions featuring a variety of guests sharing their stories of ups and downs, as well as the secrets of their success and what drives them to continue moving forward. We break down the tools and resources that will help you establish your dream career and realize your professional goals. Here's your host, J.R. Lowry. Hi, I'm J.R. Lowry, and this is Career Sessions, Career Lessons, which is brought to you by Pathwise.io. Pathwise is dedicated to helping you live the career you deserve, providing career coaching, content, courses, and community. Basic membership is free, so visit Pathwise.io and join today. Today, my guest is Somer Hackley. Somer is an executive recruiter who runs her own search firm, and she is the author of Search in Plain Sight, Demystifying Executive Search. She has more than 20 years in the search business, having done both contingency and retained search work for several firms over that time period. She started her own business right before the pandemic, wrote her book during the pandemic, and now finds herself quite busy with client work. She and her family live in the Austin, Texas area. Somer, thanks for joining me today. It's great to have you on the show. It is so great to be here, JR. Thank you for the invite and yeah, excited about it. Absolutely. Me too. So I want to start by talking about your book. Uh, that you wrote a couple of years back, right? Search in Plain Sight, Demystifying Executive Search. This was a was a COVID project of sorts, right? But I, I know it had it built on your prior experience. How did the book come to be? I'd been recruiting for 20 years, took the plunge, start my own firm, waited at my non-compete, ready to go, launched February 2020. And then March happened. And yep. so I had all these conversations going with potential clients and then they all just halted and it wasn't, I didn't feel right going up to clients being like, Hey, how's that pandemic going? Are you hiring mm. yet? You know? So I was like, you know what? It's going to stop. I'm not going to worry about it. Let me just chat with people and catch up and just say, Hey, I started my firm. Do you want me to keep you in mind when things pick back up again? How are you? How's COVID for you? What's going on? And so anyway, I found that when I approached people without pitching a role, with just saying, hi, how are you? They had lots of opinions and they were all yeah. about executive search. So all those questions and I'm just answering questions, answering questions. I'm like, you know what? Start posting on LinkedIn. I just was like, there's a, there's a book in here. I just need to yeah. write it. I just need to get, I'm like all of you are saying and asking the same thing. Let's just get it out. So that's where it came from. And why does the world of executive search need to be demystified? Right? Like, why is it a secret? I don't know. <laughs> I just don't know. It's not a secret. So I think it's just this, opaque black box that people just don't really know like why am i getting the calls or why am i not getting the calls from the big five firms or right. you know so i'm like you know what let's just tell everyone how it works and i just for whatever reason it's just not common knowledge or it's something that people say you know what it is common knowledge but i didn't know all the little things that went into it for whatever reason it's just kind of smoke and mirrors I love how you describe it in the book as the cool kids table. Everybody thinks there's a cool kids table that they don't get to sit at. And that's kind of how they look yeah. at the, the world of search. Everybody else is sort of plugged in and I'm not, and you mm -hmm. know, they're off at this table and I'm not, it's, it was right. a very good analogy. Thank you. The creator Institute, which I used to write the book after I had written it first, very poorly. I wrote it again with the help of a hybrid publisher and they were very much on teach through story, through analogy, yeah. yep. lots of analogies, but I'm glad you like it. Cause yeah, I was picturing, I think that's what people do think that there is that cool kids table and they want to be there and like, how do I get the invite? Come on. Yeah. It seemed like you really had a dual purpose, right? One was to help people better understand how to be at that cool kids table, right? How to mm -hmm. engage with recruiters, how to mm -hmm. engage with their firms, but it was somewhat as a call to action to the industry itself to perhaps address some of the shortcomings in it. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of an accurate view of things? Yeah, I think that it's to help people so they can navigate this whole world and they can get the calls, they can get the offers. And also, I think that it shouldn't be opaque and it's good for us recruiters to know the having that empathetic ear as to what yeah. job seekers are going through. Yeah. And also, I honestly selfishly wanted a resource to send to people. So now when people reach out to me like, hey, can you help me get a job? I'm like, can't, but here's a book. Yeah. <laughs> so it's actually been really helpful to 
tell people how it works without having to spend hours on end with every single person. The people I've talked to recently who have written a book that they describe somewhat as their FAQs, you know, right? and, and it's like, just to save them having to have the same conversation again and again and again, they're like, read this, then we can talk. Yes. I need to figure out how to say that eloquently, but uh, <laughs> I do say read this. <laughs> well, I can think of one person in particular who pretty much said it just like that. So you start by focusing in the book on some of the misconceptions that people have about recruiters and search firms. So what are the biggest ones as it relates to the interrelationship between a candidate and the recruiter? Hands down, number one is some people think that recruiters will help them get a job and it's just not how it works. Or they, you know, then when they reach out, they say, hey, I'm looking, how do we work together? We don't. It's a tricky message to give to people, but recruiters are hired by the hiring company to fill jobs versus serving as that candidate agent, helping them get introduced to companies to land a job. And it's nuanced because of course, as a recruiter, I care about the candidates who are in process. I care about everyone I'm talking to, but I might not have anything for you for three years. So it's just a tricky one, but that's a misconception of people, they kick off their search and then they're expecting recruiters to help them land. But there is an element of that in the contingency recruiting space, right? There is, and that's what makes it confusing to people. And so in contingency, if from what I've heard on other podcasts, we called it a hot candidate, which mm -hmm. I guess isn't the best term, but I hear MPC, most placeable candidate. So if someone is an MPC, then the whole team will rally around that person and get them interviews. But that's only if you're that product, right, for the agency. So it's less about helping you. It's more about the agency saying, I have this great person. Yeah. Look at the types of people I have and trying to get in the door that way and trying to yeah. place that person. So it's not for everybody. I've never worked with a recruiter in that capacity. I've mm -hmm. felt sometimes on the flip side as a hiring manager or a potential hiring manager that it can kind of work against you because as soon as that person brings you a candidate, then they've got a claim to say, hey, I introduced the two of you. And if your intent is not to pay a recruiting mm -hmm. fee on that particular hire, that potentially excludes that person. I know I've had companies yep. I worked for in the past where that was a bit of a knockout factor. Yep. I've had it happen. I've had it happen when I was in contingency years ago and I sent a candidate in and then they loved the candidate, but they couldn't pay a fee. And then they couldn't hire the candidate and the candidate's yeah. like, what do I do? And I was a lot younger and I didn't really know what to say. We're not going to go after the candidate. Maybe recruiters would or the company, mm -hmm. but it can be a nightmare. I wonder if it's changed for me back in the day, we wouldn't get a contract signed until almost final round in contingency. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that contracts are signed earlier. There's a relationship with HR, that sort of thing. So talk about the relationship between the recruiter and the hiring firm, because that's a part of the equation mm -hmm. that most people don't see unless they're in the hiring firm and they're in part of the search process. And that's why I dedicated a whole chapter to it. I was thinking, how do I explain what recruiters do without soapboxing and without being like, oh, I'm the best or saying all recruiters are terrible or the other side, we're all great. Here's what we, so I was like, you know, what? I'm just going to tell my story and it is what it is. And here's what I grew up with. So I gave some examples of business yeah. development meetings and those relationships. And I do think that initial relationship when the recruiter is trying to win the work or if they're handed the work from a hiring company just sets the foundation for every single thing that happens. And so if the recruiter is trying to win the work and says, oh yeah, no problem. We can find you candidates from all the major tech companies at this comp or who will relocate or this or that, you know, and then here you are as a candidate, perfect for this role, but you're not that, you're not that promise that was made. Yeah. You might not be able to go ahead. So it comes down to a recruiter having the authority and the confidence to be that consultant from the beginning, even from when they win the work, because I think that mm -hmm. dynamic, that setup can determine what candidates get to go forward and just those sorts of conversations that happen later, just that trust factor. So yeah, that's that's part of it. Yeah. And one thing I really did find interesting, having been on multiple roles in the past, so having some visibility into how this works between hiring firm and uh, the recruiting firm, you talk about how the relationships can vary a lot, right? And the relationship between 
the recruiter and the hiring firm or the hiring manager or the hiring firm's HR can really vary a lot. And that will have an impact on you as a candidate. I hadn't really ever thought about that before. A lot of the complaints I would get from candidates or job seekers when I was doing my, hey, how are you catch-ups were usually yeah. things along those lines of like, I'm not getting feedback. Like mm. what is happening? Or I'm getting strung along for three weeks and I'm sending emails, I'm calling, it's like crickets and people are just so frustrated. And I spent all this time explaining all the things like this, like those dynamics that could be going on. Because if the recruiter doesn't have access to information, if they're like throwing stones at the window of the hiring manager, like, hey, how'd that go? How'd that go? Yeah. How'd that go? So it's not always this tight knit relationship people are expecting. So it might have nothing to do with the candidate, like zero. Or if the recruiter's like, yeah, I text with my hiring managers and HR folks all the time. And I know they're at this conference this week, no big deal. Or all those things can go into it. So yeah, yeah. So that's really where all well, that came from was just explaining the mental gymnastics that people are going through a lot of the time and how a lot of the time it has to do with just that relationship and those dynamics that you have no idea. You're just not privy yeah. to. I've certainly had experiences personally where the recruiter will say, oh, they're taking a step back, they're rethinking what they want, you know, yeah. and there's a bit of frustration there. I, I wonder how much the throwing the hiring company under the bus thing is just buying time for some other reason or, you know, whether it's really what's going on. You never completely know when you're the job seeker as to what's, yeah. what's going on behind the scenes. No, there could very well be a number one candidate that they're all focused on while yep. you're sitting around waiting. And right. in those situations, I would just say to the candidate to ask, yeah. because if you ask a direct question, be like, Hey, how many other candidates are in play? Am I number one or not? Like it's kind yeah. of a question you don't want to know the answer to maybe, but they'll probably yeah. get an answer. Yeah. That's a very good point. So you have a whole section on engaging with search firms and mm -hmm. recruiters individually. So how should you go about that? I know it's not you know, shouldn't be first when you need a job. Mm -hmm. Yes. I say, first of all, don't ignore recruiters when they reach out to you when you're not yes. looking because you can just reignite those so quickly once you yeah. are. Yeah. And I can't tell you how many people don't respond to my outreach or they just respond not interested or, and it, it's honestly, the more junior the role, the more it's an issue, the more senior the role, the more responses you get, which is actually mm -hmm. kind of interesting that the more senior the role, the easier it is to get people on the phone. Cause you would think, well, those people are more busy. They're more senior, but in fact, they value right. the recruiter relationship more and they get how it works. So yeah. it's interesting, but the more junior the role, they're just getting inundated with recruiters and recruiters and recruiters and usually with the wrong roles, which I totally get. And I empathize that, you know, people's inboxes are blown up with inappropriate jobs. Yeah. But if there's a good one, if there's a good one in there, just respond because you might need that person later. And then my other bit of advice on that is be memorable, right? Because it's not about today. And so if you can leave that recruiter with, you know what, here's what I'm known for. Here's the type of things that I've done in the past in a way that they can remember you in yeah. three months, in five years or whatever. They'll call you. Yeah, yeah, they'll call you next time. Your point about taking the call, responding to the email, it's consistent certainly with the advice I've always given people because, mm -hmm. you know, you get on the radar, right? It's it's an opportunity to build a relationship with at least one person in the industry. That's more the reactive side. What about the proactive side? How should you proactively introduce yourself to recruiters and build your network and and then engage with them and nurture it? So it's all about finding the right recruiters. And I think you can spend all day doing internet research, going on all the big websites and just randomly emailing every single person you find with the same email and spray and pray, right? And see what happens. Right. And you'll likely just hit your head against the wall and be like, recruiters are the worst. They don't email you back, <laughs> you know? So I'd say yeah. instead, I would spend more time on fewer people and I'd find the right people by asking like, let's say you're a head of data, you know, a chief data officer, I would find the other chief data officers or heads of data or something tangential at analytics that you respect, that you know, that you trust and say, hey, who got you that job? What recruiter helped place you there? What recruiter yeah. sent you on interviews that you really liked? And then ask if they can refer you to that recruiter. Because it's not just the firm, it's the specific person. And then I'd yeah. even ask, not just for the partner, I'd ask for the associate or the director, or even if it's a researcher. Those junior people, I think, don't get as much email as the senior people. And the junior people are the ones that do that initial outreach to find candidates. So 
I think that a lot of the times people will um, just reach out to the most senior person on the team and think they've checked the box. This whole team knows yeah. me if I know the partner. But in fact, when I was a junior person, I was the one out there advocating for candidates, telling my partner, this is the one, like this is the candidate. Those junior people do a lot and they grow up to be senior people. So that's what I would do. I don't want to call them the gatekeepers, but they're certainly the entry point at the search, right? I mean, the partners probably, and you make this point in the book, the partners calling the people that they know best, right? That they, uh, you know, immediately think of as being suitable for a potential role that they've been hired to help fill. But at the same time, you're having the junior people on your team, cruise LinkedIn, mm -hmm. go through your firm's database, look for people that maybe you personally don't know and, and test interest, right? And mm -hmm. really shouldn't matter what level the person's at. It's, it's good just to get to know them no matter what. And sometimes those folks are more senior than anyone realizes, right? They could have been in that role for 10, 20 years also, right? They just yeah. didn't want to be a partner. Or they're just not a partner. So yeah. 100%, I would say know all the different levels, but I'd find them through your network versus yeah. LinkedIn searching or just database searching. You, you talked a minute ago about the importance of being memorable, essentially giving them your elevator pitch. And, mm -hmm. and you also talk about it being important to kind of have done the work on understanding yourself and what you're looking for and what's important to you. How does that play out in terms of how you actually engage with recruiters? Most of the time, I find that job seekers want to get through their entire resume as quickly as possible. Okay, we're on the phone. I started out here. I did this. I did this. I had this title and here I am and I'm looking. But it's up to you as a job seeker to synthesize all of those things together because the person has your resume or your LinkedIn, they have your companies and titles. What they don't have is, okay, because you've done all these things, you're really good at this, yeah. you know, and people won't remember all the things. They'll remember like three things max. Yeah. And I came to realize that the way my brain works is whenever I kick off a new search, the company is going through a journey. The role's open to solve this journey ahead right? Whatever it is, like we're going to go public, we're going to go global, we need to modernize because of you know, how many acquisitions we've made or whatever. And I'm thinking in my head, like what candidates been on that journey? So if you can articulate the journeys, like mm. think of me when a company is going through this or a culture yeah. is going through this, or you need this. So, because that's what I think of is like, who's done this journey before? So if someone can yeah. articulate that, then I think they'll stick in someone's head later. So you argue for a fair amount of transparency with recruiters, not just in what you're looking for financially or non-financially, but also in your life situation and your values. How, how do you balance not oversharing? I'd love to ask you that one too, but I, I think that in your gut, if it doesn't feel right, then don't go there. I mean, there's a element, like I, I share quite a lot with candidates and I feel like they share back in return. And like, I have a son and, you know, just what did you do this weekend kind of stuff? Like that's easy. Yeah. But, but I think if it's more than that, it's probably too much. It's important though, like anything that plays into you being in process as a candidate for a role or you accepting a role, it's a family decision. I mean, there's a yeah. lot that goes into it, especially nowadays with in office or are you going to relocate and yeah. all these sorts of things, or even the hours. And I don't think it's as taboo these days to say work-life balance right. as maybe it was a few years ago, right? So I think you probably just know, but maybe you don't. I don't know. What do you think? I would love to ask you about the oversharing piece. I'm sitting here trying to think about whether I've ever really had a candidate early in the process just open up way too much to the point of it being sort of uncomfortable. Obviously, it's helpful to know, as you said a minute ago, are they willing to move or are they not willing to move? You know, are their kids locked into a school that they don't want to pull them out of? Have they got some sort of care situation that they need to be mindful of? You know, there are all sorts of things like that that I think are relevant. The challenge, I think, all, always is in, if I say too much, I may jeopardize my candidacy or my attractiveness as a candidate for roles because you know they're thinking of reasons to exclude me at the same time it really doesn't serve anybody's interest if you push yourself into a job that isn't really going to work for you right for one reason or another yeah and i think that maybe that's the way to be thinking about it is to be upfront with the things that are so important to you that they 
are going to be exclusionary mm -hmm. factors for you. You know, if you're not willing to move from New York to the Midwest, as an example, then, you know, you got to be clear up front about that. And I'll tell people, certainly they'll say, well, I could commute. I'm like, you don't want to commute. That's like the worst existence in the history of humanity. Commuting every Monday and coming back every Thursday night or every Friday, it's just a really tough experience. And so if you really don't want to be in the Midwest, then don't talk to companies whose jobs are in the Midwest, or it could be New York, could be anywhere, but things like that, that are really, truly the kind of knockout factors for you. Just mm -hmm. might as well get them on the table sooner rather than later, because it's, it's, it's going to come to a head one way or another. As you were talking, it made me think about sometimes because I'm a recruiter and I don't work at the company, it's easy to overshare maybe, mm -hmm. but just know that anything you say to me is going to go right to the client. At the end of the day, my job is to place someone that will work out yeah. and that will thrive. And if I'm getting a weird spidey sense about somebody just because of what they're sharing, I'm going to yeah. tell the client and bring it up. So just because it's the recruiter and we're chit-chatting and talking through interview feedback, and maybe it's a light and easy conversation, that stuff's still going to pretend you're talking to the client. So, I mean, you work for the client Yeah. at the end of the day. You've got to protect that relationship because they're the ones who hired you, not the candidate. And, you know, sometimes candidates probably fall into the trap of being a little bit too comfortable. Mm -hmm. You make the point that every interaction counts, right? Even the most casual ones, even when you call about a job that they're not interested in, whatever happens in that interaction goes in the data bank, right? Yep. Even if it's just the Somer Hackley data bank, right? Exactly. Yeah. If you were helpful, if you weren't helpful, yes. Yeah. Either way, people remember. You have a section of the book that's focused on the actual search process itself. You talk about how important it is to be prepared. So what should a job searcher do to get themselves organized, to get themselves off to the right start when they are in need of their next role? I hate to start so simple, but I'd say have your LinkedIn look good. Yeah. People are going to Google you and they're going to look at LinkedIn. Like I view yeah. LinkedIn as the conversation that's happening without you in the room. So you want that to represent who you are because people will make snap judgments, whether or not you're qualified based on your LinkedIn profile. Nothing to do yeah. with your resume. Your resume comes later. Usually you send it isn't it, after a conversation or something, but LinkedIn is like, oh, do you know so-and-so they're looking? Let me look them up on LinkedIn, right? So you want to be yeah. in control of what that message is. So yeah. I would do that before you do anything. And then I do think there's, I talk a lot in the book, you know, there was a, a job seeker, Jay, who I opened the book with, mm -hmm. who he's distraught. He wasn't, he's just been layered. He's not getting this big top jobs. And he eventually did. And I figured that he was going to tell me all the cool things he learned how to interview well and be more senior and say eloquent responses to questions. And what he told me was that he really went internal and he got a therapist and he journaled and he realized where his lack of confidence was coming from. And mm -hmm. I think some of that self-work can, um, I don't know, people don't always talk about it that much, but yeah. so much of the interview process is mental and about confidence and how you come across and kind of owning what you're talking about. And so it's kind of chicken and egg, I know, but um, say that work has to get done. It's you're selling yourself at mm -hmm. the end of the day, right? And if you don't express conviction in yourself, I mean, that's a big red flag for somebody, right? Yes. Because they're going to wonder whether you whether you really believe you can do this job, let alone what they think, right? And if you don't believe it, then they definitely won't. 100%. What makes LinkedIn look good? What makes LinkedIn look bad for someone? I mean, there's a whole list. There are studies that show have a photo, right? All the simple things like that. I, I've heard from a LinkedIn expert, and I would agree that your headline if you want to be found, it should just be the title you're targeting. None mm -hmm. of the long winded many words. It's like, what do you do? Like someone's trying to figure out like, what do you do? Can you help me? The faster you can kind of cut to the chase. I think if someone has their entire resume on there and it's just long, it's difficult. And that real estate before people hit more, like they're only going to get your last three jobs. And sometimes people have other things there. And so I just make sure that what you have on that first page beyond the, you know, before the fold is how you want to represent yourself, but you can't put everything you've done. I don't mean in terms of timeline. I mean, in terms of even your last job, if you put every yeah. single thing you've done, it's probably too long. People won't read it. Right. So 
they put three things like under each job, short and sweet impact. You know, yeah. I would talk a lot about impact and what, like why you did what you did versus exactly everything about what you did. So there's tons of things, but that separate the more senior folks from more junior. And I think the more senior is succinct, they know their story, they know where they make a difference. They talk about team building and hiring. They talk about influence. They talk about the customer impact versus just tons of responsibilities. Come back to the search process. So let's flip it around, talk about it from the company's perspectives. So I, I know every search is different, but like, mm -hmm. what is the typical search process? How does it unfold between the hiring firm and the search firm? After the business is won. So sometimes business is handed to people, recruiters, or sometimes there's a bit of a competition and they interview a few search firms. So once it's all won, signed, sealed, delivered, have a brief about the role. You make sure that we all understand what the position is. And then coming up with a search strategy, where are we targeting, all those good things. And then it's just a matter of knowing where to find candidates. And personally, I network with my network. I do a lot of fresh research from target company lists. I think about what companies have gone through this journey and who's the person at those companies. And then really comes down to my reach out, my assessment, client introduction, their assessment, buttoning up their process. We try to do that in the beginning, like how many rounds, how are feedback loops going to work, candidate experience, all that kind of stuff. So there are many different steps and the more we can get figured out in the beginning, the better. Um, yeah. And also trying to figure out the dynamics between hiring manager, external recruiter, internal recruiter, because that's always mm -hmm. different too, like who does what. Yeah. But we tend to have ad hoc touch points all the time, weekly calls. So I'm sure you've interviewed thousands of people over the years. What are the things that people really do to stand out in a good way? And what are the things that people do to shoot themselves in the foot? Yeah, I would say that confidence piece is big. Someone mm -hmm. who's knows their story, they're succinct. They just, they know how to talk about themselves and they know how to relate what they've done. Like, let's say it's an actual search, not an intro call. They can easily relate what they've done to what the role is. So on the flip side, people shoot themselves in the foot is when they have their pre-rehearsed monologue that they say to every single person they're talking to. And it's like, any question you ask them, so let me ask you, why do you think you're a good fit for this position? Well, in order to answer that, let me go through my entire background. And then it's a half hour of walking through their whole resume, but yeah. they didn't talk about why they fit the role. And it's their job as a candidate to ask the right questions and to get there and to help the hiring manager or recruiter be with them on that and understanding it. So they have to be that conduit for themselves, right? Their own advocate versus just the monologue. And I'd say the biggest thing people do that shoots themselves in the foot is they just talk too much mm -hmm. and they don't know their audience. They just keep going and they, then they try to have their agenda and they just shove it into the conversation. And they just yeah. keep saying, there's another thing I've done that you should know about that you didn't ask me about. And I totally get why people are doing that. But the people that end up getting the job, they're kind of approaching it casually, but mm -hmm. they are who they are. They answer questions. You know, and it, if it yeah. works, great. And if it doesn't, great, right? Like, let's figure this out together versus, yeah. all right, I have my agenda, let's go. It's funny you bring up being too casual. I literally, I had an interview for a job I was trying to fill probably 18, 24 months ago. Mm -hmm. And one of the candidates, you know, literally it, it was early in the morning. He was in his office in the US. So I, I was in London at the time, kind of midday for me. He's literally like sitting in his no. chair way laid back. And I'm just like, do you want this job? Or it was just the weirdest thing. And yes. you know, I went back to the recruiter. This was a candidate that, that they had put forward. And I just said, this guy doesn't really want the job enough. Like we're going to have to arm twist him to, to move. It's just not going to happen. Yes. So, yeah. Well, body can, language can. does matter. <laughs> it does. Yeah. It's like, you want to show up as yourself. Versus, so yeah, that's why I hesitated to use casual with it's not just show up in your t-shirt and kick back and put your feet up and just say like, Hey, my hiring manager, let's, let's talk. But there's a balance of just being yourself versus trying yeah. too hard. Right. So yeah. dress code has certainly come down. Yeah. And I'm, I'm still not quite sure what to make of that. I mean, I really don't care if somebody ever wears a tie again, but at the same time, when you see people who take an interview call on their t-shirt, it does beg a question. It does. It does. Or hats. Yeah. I've had all kinds of things happen. So yeah, I think yeah. 
just because you're at home on Zoom, you still have to look professional. Yeah. And ask the recruiter, right? I mean, know your audience. If the company is all wearing hats and tank tops, then do it. But sometimes yeah. they're not. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. I will confess. And this is the first time I've publicly confessed this. That there was one interview that I did, I think for this job, actually. It was during COVID. You know, we were still pretty tightly in lockdown. Nobody else in the family was there. Uh, so I, I was, you know, basically on my own for some period of time. And I desperately needed a haircut, but we were doing the, you know, family haircut stage at that point. And I literally gave myself a haircut. It looked horrible in the back, but I'm like, it doesn't have to look good in the back. <laughs> like, you know, nobody's going to see the back on this call. They had no idea that like, you know, the back of my head was a complete mess. It looked, en it looked good enough in the front for me to get by because I <laughs> wanted to not look like I was, you know, too shaggy for this particular interview. I love it. It's yeah. the reverse anchor person, you know, like nice top jean shorts. Yes. It's the the front and the back. Exactly. So that's the first time I've confessed that. Some companies will use like a personality or a leadership assessment, mm -hmm. you know, battery of tests that they put candidates through. What's your take on those? You sort of for or against or situational? Maybe it's controversial, but I no, I don't, I don't really use them and I don't think they matter. <laughs> I'm just going to go out and say it. I yeah. know that there's a lot of companies that love them. The search firms love them. There are third parties that go for it. And I, um, I wonder how often they change their mind or how often are they just validating what they already think? I don't know. So maybe it just depends on the culture of the company, yeah. but I've had, I think only like three placements not work out in 20 years. And only a handful have used those tests. I don't know. I, I just, maybe most of my clients don't use them. So I haven't seen a ton of need, but I will tell you from the candidate side, I've had candidates run their results by me and they haven't been excited from other search firms. They're like, look what this test said about me. So I don't know, but I, I love your opinion on it too. Cause I feel kind of bold being like, they don't matter. I'm sure they're okay. Let me say maybe a good use for them will be marrying talent acquisition to talent management. Because I do think mm -hmm. that that can be a better relationship. And I think a lot of the times all the rich information we're getting during the interview process is kind of lost once the person starts. And yeah. so maybe if once someone starts, we have that test to help them navigate internally with opportunities for what they need in terms of leadership and growth and that kind of stuff. If the company embraces that, then maybe it'll help them once they start in terms of onboarding and and their career yeah. development. You know, yeah. To the extent that there that it's a numbers game, right? You've got a you know a, a large number of roles to fill. Mm -hmm. You've got a huge number of candidates, and you use those assessments as a sifting mechanism, and you feel like that works for you as a sifting mechanism. Mm -hmm. I could see it in those circumstances, and certainly the more technically oriented tests, like my son who does software development. I mean, you know, pretty much every interview he did when he was graduating from college involved the coding challenge, right? And sure. that's their game, right? That's, sure. that's yeah. you know, a way to measure your technical skills. But, you know, in the scheme of things, like I think about like the senior searches where, you know, they have you take some sort of personality thing, you know, they're not interviewing so many candidates that, I mean, why don't you just ask about the things that really matter and try and bring it out in the course of a conversation it feels a little bit like a crutch there in a way. Yeah. That's, that's, you said that more eloquently than I was trying. I was trying to get to this. Like, these are questions like I figure out it's hard to assess culture fit, but it's easier to understand how are decisions made? What roadblocks will this person face? How do you influence? Like who's successful? Who's not? And then yeah. ask those questions right? How do you convince people? Where have you hit a roadblock where you need to gain buy-in from someone? And how do you do that? How have you done that before? You know, did you inherit your team or did you build your team? And how do you retain? How do you, like, you can ask all these questions, right? And then you can yeah. know in your head how all the other candidates answered and who's successful at the client. So yeah, maybe we're all getting there just th whether it's a third-party company or we're just asking those questions ourselves. So let's say the process plays out. I'm going to come back to the process. You you don't get the job. How do you get the recruiter to take the time to give you feedback on why things didn't work out? First of all, they should. Ugh. There's not much you can't, you can't make people. But I would say the more open you are to feedback every single step of the way, 
and the more you ask for feedback and how you re if you react well to feedback, you're more likely to get feedback because if people are, there's a difference between being defensive and trying to help make your case. If, if I legit, you know, like even yesterday or not yesterday, Friday, I was asking two candidates that look, you know, I was really hesitant to put you forward because I don't think you've actually built and run a business with full PL. Listen, I think you've been more of this strategy role. Like I just flat out told them. And then they said, no, actually I did this here and here in this other place. I'm like, oh good. I'm glad we talked about it. Versus talking in generalities of like, of course I've done this. Like i I'm the best at this. How could you even question that I've done that? Have you read my resume? Like there's just different ways to take feedback. And if you're having a conversation and listening and responding appropriately, you'll get better feedback because yeah. I think when you're getting very simple feedback, it's, it, it could be a, the recruiter doesn't have full feedback or B, they just don't want to tell it to you because they're, they're afraid they don't want to get into a whole thing. So yeah, I just think if you can't get the person on the phone, I mean, that's a whole other story, <laughs> you know, like why are they not responding to you? That could be the recruiter's problem or something you did. But when you're in that moment, I think just being open to feedback will help you get feedback. And, and on the flip side, when you do get the offer, how would you counsel people to think about negotiating the offer? My whole take on comp is you negotiate the entire time. It's not at offer stage. Mm -hmm. Don't bring up comp at offer. It's too late. It's done. I think once it's like, here's your offer, it should not be a surprise. It should be what you've been talking about for a month. So I think once you're getting into second rounds, even just say, hey, mm -hmm. can we talk more about comp? Here's what I'm thinking, or here's what I need to make. Like, first of all, know what you want. Uh, a lot of times people are like, I don't know. I don't want to talk about calm. What do you think? That's not how you get what you want, <laughs> you know? So know what you want, have the data to back it up and talk about yeah. it early. So I, I just don't think it's a back and forth, back and forth, whoever talks first, you know, or like all these things people do. I just think if you talk about it early, you bring it up. If they haven't, you'll end up getting what you want. You, I love talking about calm early. You do talk about the anchor, the importance of mm -hmm. setting the anchor, right? Which argues for you sort of setting your comp expectations first, right? You being the one who initiates, you know, so that they have a sense of, of where, where they need to come in. Right. Otherwise you risk run the risk of losing control relative to what you want. If they end up setting that anchor price. Yeah. I, I truly believe that. I, I think it's a risk. If you say, I don't know what I should make. What do you think? What can the role pay? Cause mm -hmm. now I can throw any number. First of all, I don't want to throw a number at you. If I have no idea what the company will pay you. Right. It's, I've known you for 20 minutes. I don't know. I just, I don't know. I don't know how senior you are yet. It's tricky. And so I can give a huge range just to protect myself a little bit, but I have seen the candidates that get what they want. They know what they want and they can just say it in, in certain terms. This is how much I need to make. This is why. And, yeah. and then they have a lot of detail behind it. So I, I think it takes some time to get there. You have to create your own data set by interviewing and talking and thinking, but I truly believe that. I really do. I, I've seen it in action many times. In the time we've got left, let's spend a few minutes talking about your journey. So you went to Tufts. When you were a student there, what did you envision yourself doing professionally? I was one of those people that wanted to be employed right away. I've always had a job since I was young. As soon as I could make money, I made money and just every summer. So I tried out everything. I interned yeah. everywhere. It's like, I want to go in advertising. I want to go like, and then one day I was just like, I met with someone doing all these alumni interviews and she's like, you should go into sales. I'm like, interesting. I never, because I was majoring in econ. Like, I don't know. So yeah, then I interviewed for every single sales job I could find in Manhattan. And so that's how I found recruiting. Was Manhattan a key criteria for you? Yeah, I grew up in Westchester outside the city, so I knew yeah. I wanted to be back. So yeah, I was just looking in New York. So you went into contingency recruiting pretty much right away, right? Yeah, yeah. I had the offer lined up and yeah, started a week after graduating. And I just interviewed for every single sales job possible. And I just found recruiting spoke to me and it's selling people versus things. And yeah, yeah I just fell in love with it. And then you sort of made the jump over to the retained search world, which I'm sure was a fairly big culture shock for you at the time. I didn't realize how hard it is for people to do that, I guess. Like I, I didn't, like when I showed up at CT Partners, they were like, never tell anyone you worked in contingency. Like I didn't know it was like a, a thing. And later in life, now I embrace my entire background, who cares? But at the time, like, oh, 
like I don't have an MBA and I didn't grow up in big search as a researcher and this and that, yeah. but yeah, it was different. I mean, mainly we're talking to very senior people and, and like I wrote about in the book, we had to fill the job. That was the biggest change for me. Contingency, you're, you've got your hot candidate, you know, you're trying to get open doors, yep. find interviews, get them as many interviews, it's just it's like hardcore sales, standing up, yelling, screaming. And this was very different. This was, yeah. we have to fill this role and just get in my head around that. So while you were at CT, you were doing well, you were getting noticed, but you didn't want to become a partner. Yeah. Cause I couldn't do business development. I'm like, who's going to pay me? Who's going to give me a search? Like I was a really, really good candidate finder. I had seen too many people get promoted to principal, which is the mm -hmm. first kind of quota revenue generating position, and then just get fired or laid off or just struggle. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't see why anyone would pay me versus you all. Like, I just, I don't get it. So I'm like, I'll just stay here. I'll just stay here and work on searches and, and be an awesome director for a yeah. long time. That is fine. So looking back on that, was that the right decision for you? Essentially, you're kind of sticking with what you were you were good at, what you loved doing, even if it meant a more junior role with less pay, less status? Yeah. I don't think I would have been a successful partner at a big firm at yeah. that time in my career. I didn't have the relationships. I didn't have people that would give me the work versus my boss or anyone else. Like I just, I didn't see how that would be successful. So I think it was the right thing. I was really happy. I was really happy. And I wasn't looking. I got recruited over to the boutique I was at, Marlon Hawk, for a long time. And they just recruited me over. And it was a cool opportunity to be a, kind of a bigger fish in a smaller pond and build something again. So that yeah. was fun. What prompted you to go out on your own and how have you found it? Lots of things. I'd say as you become more and more senior in recruiting, at least in my experience, you get farther away from recruiting. So I was running huge accounts. It was awesome. But I felt like I was pretending to know the candidates. You can't work on 30 searches at a time. You, know, you can be the face of it, but I don't want to be the face of it. So I felt like I want to do the recruiting myself. Like I want to know, like, and also that's the part of the job I love. Mm. And, and it's just... I hate making promises to clients that I can't personally execute on. All these clients are paying us to fill these roles and they all have pain around these positions being open and I can't fill them all by myself. And I had an awesome team, like so awesome, but I still, I was getting root canals, stressed out. It was like just, yeah. it was just so stressful having all these clients. And I'm like, you know what? I think I can just quit, have three clients at a time and do all the work myself and have my director, my assistant help out with interview scheduling and everything else that she does and rather than 30 at a time. So it was really yeah. to do the recruiting again and to not pretend to know candidates. So what's ahead for you now? What are, what are your goals for the next few years? I hate to say it, but I don't, I don't necessarily know. I love what I'm doing and I'm pretty content with this. Things keep happening, right? Like I didn't expect to build you know, to write the book. I didn't expect to be invited to speak at these universities. I, things are just kind of happening. And meanwhile, I'm still recruiting and I'm really busy with clients and I don't want to hire anybody. I don't want to be a part of a big firm. I, I'm really happy doing this. So I think I'm just going to keep on keeping on and filling roles and trying to make my little dent in the world and just seeing what happens. But yeah, I mean, we'll see. We'll see. There's all kinds of like ideas I've had on the recruiting side in terms of training recruiters or training internal recruiters and like people have asked me these things. So I just have to see, I have to see how that plays out. Recruiting is my love. And so I think this is just fun. It keeps me busy because every search is different and every client's yeah. different. So it doesn't get boring. When you and I talked a year ago, you talked a little bit about just this idea of whether you should scale your impact. Is that something that you're still thinking about or do you just love the recruiting part? Yeah, I just love this. So yeah. yeah, I think at that time, I was probably still feeling like I had to pretend to want to scale because people, at least, and I do a lot of work with tech people. Mm. I don't know if people understand that you don't need to hire people ever. You know, it's like, well, what's next? What's next? Get bigger, but get bigger. It's like, yeah. but then that's what I had before. 
And so the whole point is for me to do the work so that we fill roles faster. And I, I'm the one representing the client and the candidate. And I know both inside and out. And it's so much easier. A client could call me like yesterday was Sunday. I talked to a client on the phone while driving about all these candidates because I know them all so well. Yeah. You know, it's so easy versus, oh, wait, I don't need all my notes and my, t-, you know, so I don't need to go back to that. Yeah. I think now I own it. I'm like, you know what? I'm not hiring because this is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so any parting thoughts for our audience in terms of managing their career or working with search firms more specifically? The way I ended the book, I'll probably end this too, is when you're hiring, remember the recruiters that were great and use them to fill your roles. Because mm-hmm. I think that's the only way we all change this whole, anything that's broken with recruiting will get fixed with that. So just hire the people that give feedback, interviewed you well, are ethical, all those yeah. sorts of things, because then we'll just perpetuate good behavior. Uh, and it definitely matters. I mean, I've I've seen good and less good, you know, mm-hmm. from the hiring side, and it, it, it does matter. It matters a Absolutely. lot. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing this, Summer. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. Yeah. This was awesome. It's good to catch up. And there's a lot of valuable insight in here. So I'm sure... Anybody who's listening or watching will find it valuable. So thank you for taking the time. I want to thank Somer for joining me today to help demystify the world of executive search and cover her own career journey as well. If you're ready to take control of your career, you can visit pathwise.io. If you'd like more regular career insights, you can become a Pathwise member. It's free. You can also sign up on the website for the Pathwise newsletter and follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you for listening to Career Sessions, Career Lessons. We hope the nuggets of wisdom shared today help guide your path to the successful career of your dreams. This podcast series is part of Pathwise.io, which is here to help you live the career you want. We provide a comprehensive mix of career and professional development events, insights, tools, and exercises backed by a group of leading coaches and other career management experts. If you aspire to something more or just something different in your career, join us at pathwise.io. You can find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. See you again on the next episode.